Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word, the book of Job, chapter 11. Job, of course, is fighting off Satan when he doesn't realize that's even his enemy. Job, as it is human nature, probably deep down wants to blame himself, but he doesn't know what for. He can't understand it. I mean, he's always been a righteous man. He, um, as I've stated uh, multiple times, he even gave offerings to God for forgiveness of his children, their sins that he didn't know whether or not they were even committing them. So he was very careful to please our Father. So he's um, probably blaming himself. His three friends are blaming Job. And in a sense, um, uh, Satan gets a free ride. Neither Job nor his three friends take a look at Satan and say he could be causing this. Of course, you are privy to that information and you know Satan's tearing him up. So we come to uh, Zophar, Zophar today, for, which is to say sparrow. And um, he, he doesn't quite act like a sparrow though. Of course a sparrow is always getting into other birds and picking around and getting in the way and causing fusses, you know, and and this speaker will probably be the hardest one on Job of all of them at this time. He really comes down on Job. So with that having been said, I mean, if you've got friends like this, you don't need enemies. So if you ever hear a preacher start using chapter 11 for what God says, you know you got a, a dumbbell behind your pulpit, all right? because this character is for the birds. That's why they named him Sparrow, I guess. Chapter 11, the book of Job, verse 1. Then answered Zophar the Naamathite. You know, that, that means pleasant, pleasantness. Whoa, what a, what, a, what a dog they threw out there. And said, verse 2, Should not the multitude of words be answered? And should a man full of talk be justified? He said, what, what about all these words you're speaking, Job? Do you think they don't deserve an answer? And he said, uh, do you think a man that claims he's always right, that he's never sinned, should be listened to? I mean, he comes out the gate. Boy, I mean, he's fixing Job's wagon in good shape. Three, should thy lies make men hold their peace? Do you think I'm going to hold my peace while you're lying, Job? And when thou mockest, shall no man make thee ashamed. When you talk all this nonsense, Job, you know, you see, this is why you want to be careful of men and their traditions. Job hasn't lied, not one time. He has not spoken nonsense, but an inquiry into what's wrong. What have I done? What's happening? Nothing wrong with that. And never one time did he accuse God. But when, when you've got a friend that comes along and says, I can tell because of the sad sack condition you're in that you're nothing but a bald-faced liar and I'm going to put you in your place. Now, basically, that's what he said. Verse 4. For thou hast said, My doctrine is pure, and I am clean in thine eyes. Now, I hope you followed Job well enough to know that this old boy lied there. I mean, he, we may not classify it as a total lie, but he stretched the truth so far it'll snap right back in your face. Job never claimed to be pure. Uh, he overstated it by a half a mile. Job has admitted imperfection, but has not uh, done anything other than say, I'm innocent. He didn't say he was some goody-goody two-shoes. So this boy is, um, 
He's got uh, trying to say that Job said he was spotless in the Hebrew. That's what it says. So he's lying himself. Five. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips against thee. Against thee? How about for thee if he was a friend? Verse 6. And that he would show thee the secrets of wisdom, that they are double to that which is. Know therefore that God exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserveth. Exacteth in the Hebrew, the word is really to forget. He, he forgets um, uh, more than what you deserve. You, you're getting a lot less than what you deserve, Job. Well, boy, I don't know how he could think he deserved a whole lot more whenever he was about dead. He had lost all of his children. He had lost uh, all of his properties. He was, his help had gone from excellent to pot. So, um, and twice that would certainly have killed a man, no doubt about it. And when someone begins to say that um, God would show you the secrets of his wisdom, he does. It's in his word. And you're supposed to be wise enough to spot a fake when you see one. Let me, let me rephrase that. God's Word will give you wisdom that you can spot a fake like this, but not only a fake in the Scripture, but also in daily life. It's important. Verse 7, Canest thou by searching find out God? Canest thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? Um, can, do you think... Uh, this is said sarcastically. He's saying, Job, do you think you can go to the depth that God can in wisdom? Well, you, you know and I know, I don't care who you were, you would have to answer in the negative on that. No mortal man can go to the depth of knowledge and wisdom that God can. Verse 8, it is as high as heaven. What canest thou do? Question. Deeper than hell. What canst thou do? This is kind of higher in heaven and deeper in hell. And what do you think you're doing? Uh, you know, with friends like this, that's one like you'd pop right in a kisser if he got too close as far as I'm concerned. And I, of course, being an old Marine, you know, we're not used to taking this sort of rabble from a, a good friend because a good friend won't talk to you like that. Verse 9. The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. Well, you know, now, who, could, who couldn't say that? God's knowledge is broader than the earth and it's deeper than the sea. Well, of course it is. Everybody knows that. But let me ask you a question. What has that got to do with solving Job's question? I mean, that is milk of God's word that God is all, all wisdom. It doesn't help Job's case to make that statement known. That's like taking milk and pouring it when you need strong salve to heal the man and wisdom. Verse 10, as we continue. If he cut off, or, or if God uh, presses on, passes on, passes you by, and shut up, that is to say, imprisons men or gather together uh, and the Hebrew means to judgment then who can hinder him who can stop God nobody can that but that's that that's a brilliant statement what I mean that's something that a Sunday school child knows God has all wisdom all wisdom comes from God but what is this going to do for Job I'm just telling you how a slicker a slick willy can downgrade the truth to a point that, um, that um, that's an old southern term that means a sharpie, all right? Don't anybody get nervous or anything. It's just a common old southern saying. But that's, that's, this is the way they operate. Words, 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 all but what gets to the truth and the depth of the fact. It's like shadow or spar dancing with your own shadow, all right? never says anything other than a few basic truths of God's Word that are taught in Sunday school, but not in in-depth classes. Um, 
verse 11, and he, and he, for he knoweth vain men. And that's empty-headed men, all right? Who he seeketh wickedness also. Will he not then consider it? That's kind of like saying, Job, you think he doesn't know what you're doing, claiming all this perfection? And look at you, you sucker, you're suffering like no, no one I've ever seen suffer and saying you haven't done anything wrong. Do you think God is not fair? Of course, it was Satan doing it. You know it, I know it. Verse 12, for vain, and this word in the Hebrew is empty, for empty man, an empty-headed man would be wise, though man be born like a wild ass's coat. This really kind of loses it. He said, uh, if, if an empty-headed fool can become wise, then a, then a wild ass can, born to wild ass, can become a man. Well, that's about as dumb a statement as you could make, but I've heard worse. 13, if thou prepare thine heart, that's to say your mind, and stretch out thine hands toward him. Now, we're really getting down to a deep truth, all right? What, what is it when you... When you um, Prepare your mind and stretch out your hands toward him. You have to drop what you got in your hand, right? It's repentance. Now, Job had repented from the day the dude had gotten there. He was in sackcloth and ashes, which is a, a um, method of repentance and sorrow and mourning. And he had been praying out to God for good and knowledge to, to his problem. And, but this dude comes along and adds to the injury by saying, do it more. He hadn't been watching Job or he would have known he was doing this all along. Hey, I'm a realist. I look at things as they are. And this dude is a case, I'll tell you. Verse 14, if iniquity, if sin be in thine hand, put it far away and let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. 15, for then shalt thou lift up thy face without spot. Yea, thou shalt be steadfast and shalt not fear. This is kind of like an evangelist would be drumming, beating the drum of, uh, of a teacher, all right? Giving these in-depth looks. Repent and you'll be happy. 16. Uh, and understand, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with repenting, but dope, Job's been doing it since this began. So... It means there's something a little deeper here and he needs a little more than a Sunday school class of some simple basic facts. It's something deeper. And sometimes you have to look deeper than your friends even know of. 16. Because thou shalt forget thy misery and remember it as waters that pass away. If you'll do like I tell you, Job, your troubles will walk a wash away like water under a bridge. It'll be gone. Good words, huh? You probably heard them from a pulpit. But does that really get to your problem? Did it get to Job's problem? I don't think so. 17. And thine age, now sharpen up real good for me here. I want you that think on a different level to think. And thine age shall be clearer than the noonday. Thou shalt shine forth. Thou shalt be as the morning. Now, I want to tell you this word, um, age, in the Hebrew is helet. Helet. It is the same word, the equivalent in the Greek is eon. We're in an eon of time. Now, it's called the flesh age. And you can look at this in a deeper sense. God himself can put a little deeper truth to kind of uh, to, to, uh, correct this man as he's speaking to let you know if, um, if um, you are familiar with the age that your vision will become clearer even in the night as it would be at noonday. In other words, if you know about the first eon, earth age, and this one and the one to come, then uh, you'll, you'll be doing pretty good. I can't help but believe there's a deeper thought within that, be that as it may. 18, and thou shalt be secure because there is hope. Yea, thou shalt dig about thee. That means you really search out the truth. And thou shalt take thy rest in safety. 
Not the way this dude is saying it, but if you take it on the deeper level, hey, that's the way. God works in miraculous ways for those that care to dig, those that care to search, those that care to look at reality and yet determine the spiritualism of our Almighty Father into the truth that He plants in our minds if you're willing to receive. 19. Also thou shalt lie down, and none shall make thee afraid, yea, many shall make suit against thee. But if you'll do like I tell you, if you'll repent and just uh, be in church every time the door opens, I mean, people will search after you. That means to suit. That means to court. They're, they're going to be hunting you out, Job, because looking for your advice and your guidance. Probably this is a carryover because this old boy probably has come to Job many a time and asked for advice. And I'm sure Job loaded him up and with good advice and besides materials and sent him on his way. A little, little get backness here. 20. But the eyes of the wicked shall fail. They can't see it. It doesn't matter how much they dig. They can't see the truth. And they shall not escape, and their hope shall be as the giving up of the ghost. And this was a low blow to Job because Job had already kind of wished it. He wished for death. And he kind of just kind of gave him a little extra jab. You know, comes along, eats him out, calls him a liar, and then has the audacity to end it. If you'll just repent, you'll be all right. Though Job's been repenting from the beginning. Isn't that something? Now, I don't know. I hope you don't have any friends like that. Because if you do, like I stated, you sure don't need any enemies. Let's let Job get even with him, all right? Job chapter 12, verse 1. And Job answered and said to, No doubt... But ye are the people, or there's no doubt you're perfect, and wisdom shall die with you. Now that, I think, is funny. I think that is so funny. You are so smart that when you die, wisdom will leave the earth. Now that's, that's, that's you know, Job's kind of coming around here. He's getting his back up a little bit, like one of God's elect should. All right? He doesn't have to listen to that kind of junk. Verse 3, and many might say, well, what do you mean, junk? That's scripture. No, he called him a liar. And the scripture is from the evil side. Can you understand and discern spiritually between that that is evil and that that is good? Then come to the party. Verse 3, Job continues, but I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you. Yea, who knoweth not such things as these? I know your Sunday school lesson you're putting forth about repenting, but I've been repenting since day one. Hey, you know, he's slapping him right back in place here. Verse 4. I am as one mocked of his neighbor, my own friends making fun of me, who calleth upon God and he answereth him, the just upright man is laughed to scorn. According to your reputation and what you're saying. Five. He that is ready to slip with his feet is as a lamp despised in the thought of him that is at ease. One that's about ready to slip into some really bad trouble is about as welcome. The word lamp here is torch, okay? Now a torch is, must be, it usually is some matter of uh, material soaked in oil or tar of some kind. And when you light it and it's burning, it's not too bad. But you turn that thing over and daub it out and see what it smells like. Whew. Oh, get it away from me. I mean, it stinks. Stinks bad, all right? He's saying that uh, this is kind of like, uh, according to what you're saying, uh, that there is contempt for misfortune. Six. The tabernacles of robbers prosper, and they that provoke God are secure. Into whose hand God bringeth abundantly. He's this kind of, according to your message, this is what you're saying. Because Job knew he was innocent, all right? Verse 7, as we continue. But ask now the beast 
and they shall teach thee. And the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee. I like this because what Job is doing, he's backing off away from man. And he's saying, hey, nature itself is smarter than you are, dude. Eight. Or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee. And the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. Um, can you learn from nature itself and how God protects and loves his nature? Nine. Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? Who in the world cannot learn from the workings of the Lord's hands? He's in control. He's in charge. Ten. In whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Now there you've got a man of God speaking a very true statement. If you ever need a backup to that, go to Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, because you will find there that all souls belong to God. It just really turns my um, mind when I hear someone say, ah, someday I'm going to get around to giving my soul to God. I'm sorry, sucker, it's too late. He owned it coming out the gate. He owned it in the first earth age. You, you might submit to him, but you already owe your soul to God, and it's up to God what he wants to do with it. All right? He might send you to heaven, and he might send you to hell. He might allow you into the kingdom, and he might decide you're helpless, hopeless rather. So um, you can learn a lot from nature and what nature accepts and rejects. Hopefully when... When um, God enters into the picture, we have a fairness and a justification. But don't ever, I would hope after you read this book of Job, don't ever leave Satan out of the issue or you're going to come up short. Okay, verse 11 as we continue. Doth not the ear try words? I mean, you hear them and your mind runs through them. And the mouth tastes his meat. You, you discern, analyze. 12. With the ancient is wisdom. Boy, that's true. Learn from other people's mistakes, not your own. And in length of days, understanding. Just being patient, trying to understand, it will come. I hope you understand by this, Job isn't, has not given up. Job knows that some way through this, and as much as his soul belongs to God, God is going to let him know the reason for this agitation and loss. 13. With him is wisdom and strength. He hath counsel and understanding. That's what he, God sent this book to us for, this letter, a, a, a love letter even, if you would, because he loves you that this wisdom and counsel comes from him. Verse 14, Behold, he breaketh down, and it cannot be built again. He shutteth up a man, and there can be no opening. In other words, when he imprisons you, you're imprisoned good. And I'm glad for that, because Satan will be imprisoned through the millennium. And in Isaiah chapter 14, we are told exactly how helpless Satan is in those bands of imprisonment placed there by God at one of his servants. Uh, 15. Behold, he withholdeth the waters, and they dry up. That's all he's got to do. Hold back the water, the land dries up. Also, he sendeth them out, and they overturn the earth. Man, that can be a, a terrible flood. God's in control. Got it? 16, with him is strength and wisdom, the deceived and the deceiver are his. I, I, I want you to, do you know who the great deceiver is? It's Satan, of course. So let me read that again, and you take in the full uh, parameters of your knowledge and wisdom and your ability to grasp understanding, and listen to that again. With him, God, is strength and wisdom, 
the deceived and the deceiver are his. In other words, they are all under his control. This is one of the reasons that Job would never give up on God. He knew and trusted him to know that there was a reason that God was using him in this respect. And he naturally, with through suffering, did a lot of wondering and questioning. But he didn't lose wisdom. Why? You know why. What, what, did, what did God say to soul, Satan? You can do what to him? You can uh, tantalize him. You can even bother his health, but leave his soul alone. You cannot kill him. You cannot take his life. Okay? Well, that's one thing Satan couldn't do. And it's obvious he's maintaining that with just that much. Don't you know our father was proud of him? Oh, I, I'm going to tell you what. I'll bet Satan cursed aloud when he heard Job say this and God smiled at the devil. <laughs> told you. Told you, you sucker, you. You couldn't get Job. You know, God is, takes the same joy from his election today that do his bidding. Verse 17, he leadeth counselors away spoiled and maketh the judges fools. Uh, he, he can drive them mad if he chooses. 18, he looseth, looseth the bond of kings. Uh, he looseth bonds that are imposed by kings being translated and girded, girdeth their loins with a girdle. Uh, he uh, can... Uh, as they take their office. He still controls. 19. He leadeth princes. I want you to translate this word princes as priest, all right, because that's what it should be. He leadeth priests away spoiled and overthroweth the mighty. You know, without truth, God's truth, you're in trouble. Verse 20. He removeth away the speech of the trusty um, um, and uh, taketh away the understanding of the aged. In other words, there comes a time when you'll get a generation that they're pretty, he strikes them dumb, okay? Can even go for politicians. Acting like a bunch of kids when it comes to making decisions. Children trained in God's word are a lot smarter than that. Verse 21, he poureth contempt upon princes or priests and weakeneth the strength of the mighty. Our Father handles it. When you come to the knowledge of that, your faith in him amplifies itself. 22, he discovereth deep things out of darkness and bringeth out to light the shadow of death. Hidden mysteries he brings to the light of the spiritual mind, the spiritual eye, whereby the spiritual eye can see the depth of the mystery of God's plan, whereby one that has not opened his spiritual eye is absolutely dumb to it, ignorant. Now, there's no, that's not an insult. It is, it is a sacred thing to open, and you've heard me say that sometimes you have to close the flesh eye to open your spiritual eye. And when you go into God's Word and discover the deep things, then the deep things simplify the entire Word whereby it comes forth in your mind in the simplicity in which God through the Son teaches it. Verse 23, He increaseth the nations and destroyeth them. He, he can have it both ways. He can do it either way. He enlargeth the nations and straighteneth them again. He, he makes them small again if he chooses. 24. He taketh away the heart or mind of the chief of the people of the earth and causeth them to wander in a wilderness where there is no way and they have no guide. Well, you've always got that standard or guide on before you and his name is Christ, the anointed. 25. 
they grope in the dark without light. And he maketh them to stagger like a drunken man. And Job is kind of laying on the line here. And really, that's what this old boy that just the last round, the last debate here uh, was. He, I mean, he, it was just a bunch of words, 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 so forth. I mean, all, all he did was accuse Job when he had no idea, no idea whatsoever what God was doing in Job's life. You and I know that God was setting an example for one and all times how that man should be aware of Satan or he will mess you up good. And then God was gracious and loving enough that he gave us power and authority over Satan or any of his little demons in Christ's name. Job continues on. He's not through. Chapter 13, verse 1. Lo, mine eye hath seen all this. Mine ear hath heard all. Heard and understood it. Job said, I I've got that part down pat. In other words, he was kind of getting back at this guy for throwing him a little Sunday school lesson when he was obvious if he'd been paying attention, he was doing those things. To what ye know, the same do I know also. I am not inferior unto you. And Job being pretty straightforward here. He's saying, don't bring me that stuff. Surely, verse 3, Surely I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to reason with God. Verse 4, But ye are forgers of lies. Ye are all physicians of no value. You come here to make me well, and if anything, you're making me sick, or you're making me sicker. You know, like I say, with a, with a doctor like that, who, who, um, who needs anything, all right? Verse 5, Oh, that ye would altogether hold your peace. If you just keep your mouth shut, and it should be your wisdom. If, if you would shut your mouth and observe what's going on, you might at least gain a little bit of wisdom and maybe he didn't even say it, but I feel he was reasoning it spiritually. Maybe you could help me a little bit. But he's pretty turned off to them right at this moment. Six, hear now my reasoning. These are my thoughts. And hearken to the pleadings of my lips. You listen to my case. Seven, will ye speak wickedly for God and talk deceitfully for him? In other words, God is judge and you are judging me. You're trying to put yourself in God's place and all you are is a forger of lies. Pretty strong talk. Will you speak wickedly for God and talk deceitfully for him? That's a dangerous thing. Verse 8, and we'll complete this lecture. Will ye accept his person? Will you contend for God? Um, what he's saying here is you're trying to take God's part and you're trying to take God out of it. And, and uh, I'll, I'll settle for letting God judge me is what, uh, what uh, Job is saying here. My friend, it's important in your life that you be very weary, wary, be careful of people. For there are all sorts of people in this world. Why? Satan is the prince of the air and he has much influence with many people. Therefore, you are not to allow people to turn you off. You are to be faithful and true with no doubt about your feelings and love toward our Father, for he's in control. But you want to be very careful at what value you place on the words of men that cannot be documented in God's Word. If that were to be the case, if we were to totally go by men's Word, then you would have probably a school system that teaches evolution and not creation. Though any intelligent being and I'm, I mean that strongly, any intelligent being knows 
if you have made any study whatsoever of geology and archaeology that evolution is a fraud and a lie. For for evolution to be an actuality, it must be an eternal, never-ending process. It doesn't exist. You would still have half monkey and half man by their theory. Well, man is still the same today as he was all the way back. The, the amoeba is a still amoeba. An elephant is an elephant. A snail is a snail. And there is no evolving of anything except uh, uh, hot shots that think in man's terms without any documentation that those people that are easily misled will follow anything and you know something? They're about right. So what is my point? Follow your father's word. It was written long ago. The book we're studying in, which is just full of the best advice you'll ever receive in this earth as for as judgment of your and discernment of your own capabilities in serving God. As to how you should react to it, both the physical, listen to me, both the physical flesh people as well as the higher divine power as well as the wicked higher power, which is to say Satan, knowing how to deal with these. It's very important. I, I'm very appreciative of Job and his lecture as we close this lecture. He's, maybe he'll plant a little seed in some of these yo-yo's heads. So we'll stop with that. Don't miss any of these lectures. We're going, we're, we're going right on through rapidly through this Job. And um, it's good. It's good. It's educational. It'll give you a little foundation in life. And it'll even bring a smile to your face occasionally. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you? The book of James. James is a book that I know you'll enjoy because it is written when you rightly divide it to those that are scattered abroad. That's to say the 12 tribes, the 10 tribes scattered abroad, being very specific in your freedom of Christianity, the repentance, uh, giving much personal instruction as far as controlling our thoughts and finding peace and giving us those parameters wherein Christianity uh, defining those things that come from the Word of God. Example, that uh, bitter and sweet water cannot come from the same spring. Well, from God's Word, you should not have both either. The practice of healing brought forth in this book of James. I know you're going to like it. James, that great book. All right, there we are back again. The 800 number, please, 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a specific church, denomination, or individual or organization. Let's just teach God's Word. It's quite capable of taking care of itself and uh, straightening the whole world out. All souls belong to God. Ezekiel 18.4. I hope I'm right on that. I'm sure I am. All right? Check it out anyway. And find it's there somewhere, give or take a few. Let our Father know that you love Him, all right? His Word is strong. It brings wisdom. It changes lives. It makes that that is mediocre something special. It makes that that is poor, weak, and cowardly powerful and strong. God's Word will do that for people. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world at this time, it's good to hear from you. Your announcer. At the end of the hour, we'll give you our mailing address. If you've got a prayer request, you don't need that number. You don't need an address. He knows what you're thinking. Let him know that you love him. Do you understand? He put these people through all these things so that you would have this information at your fingertips whereby you don't have to experience those things. You can come out the gate fighting 
all right? Satan, of course. So let him know that you love him, and if you have a, a uh, after repentance, then give him your plea for help in whatever it might be, health, whatever. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, touch, Father, in Yeshua's precious name, amen. Okay, let's see what kind of, excuse me, questions we have today, and here we go. Chest, uh, um, this is, uh, I cannot make out that name. I'm going to say Charlie from Indiana, but I don't think that's right. Could you tell me what I-N-R-I, which is written on the top of the cross, means? It's Latin, and... Uh, the I means Jesus, the N is Nazareth, R is Rex, which means king, and I is Judas, which is to say Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Later in the book of John, the chief priest would come by and say, I told you not to write king of the Jews, but then he claimed to be. Well, he was really, if you call that last I, if you let it signify Israel, as he was king of Israel, then you'll have it. Dave from Texas. After Judas killed himself, did he still go to heaven? Well, well Dave, what makes you think that Judas killed himself? Have you, have you I, I know it says he hanged himself. But that same Greek word, if you really go to the depth of it, it means he choked in sorrow. Now, he repented, did he not? You bet he repented. So, and then as you read in Acts chapter 1, verse 18, he was cut open from his apple, apple, Adam's apple to his whatever, all right? I mean, all the way down below his belly button, he was cut open and his entrails poured out on the ground, besides being hanged. Now, you know, a wise person or any person that's had any experience at all in uh, warfare or bringing death to people knows this boy had a lot of help. So naturally the Kenites butchered him, all right? So, and he repented. So I'm not going to judge him. That's God's place. But hey, I'm sure not going to count him out. Joe from Iowa. Why does God still allow Satan to live? Well, to test you, Job. Job, rather. I'm calling him Job here. Maybe he's having a time like Job. Satan lives today to see if we've got what Job had. Only God gives us a great advantage. He allows us to kick him off of us and send him back where he came from. God wants nothing that hasn't been tested with the, the same severity, by that I mean depth, that the very first person that overcame was tested. But why he's fair? And everyone must be tested to prove themselves worthy, or they're not, we don't want them with us. All right? If they can't cut it, hey, have a good trip to the grave, friend. Have, have a good ride out to Hades, all right? to the lake of fire. Because if you, can't, if you can't practice discipline and stay focused on God's word and love him and the brethren, we don't want you. All right? now, I'm not talking to Joe. I'm just answering why God hasn't killed Satan. Satan is the best tester tube you've ever seen. All right? he, he, lets, he works old people over pretty good. But you, like Job, Joe, are going to come through like a rose. Matt from Texas. Who will be the Antichrist? Well, it's not up for grabs, Matt. It's very clearly one entity. And there is only one entity that has been condemned to death at this time. And the son of perdition is the Antichrist. The word perdition in the Greek means the one that is going to perish, meaning he's already judged. That was judgment took place in Ezekiel 28, verses 18 and 19. And that person is Satan, the old devil. He wants to play Jesus. So it isn't a multiple of choices. There's only one. It, it doesn't leave much to ponder about. Um, Virgil from Alabama. 
who are the ethnos? Any uh, people other than the ten, ten tribes of Israel are ethnos, which it means ethnic people. It is a very honorable title, not as some people would make it. Uh, you will find that the ethnos will still be in heaven at the very end, and thank God for it. J uh, Revelation 21, verses 20 through 24. The word nations in English is ethnos in the Greek. Jay from Michigan. What did Jesus mean when he said, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit? Well, a lot of people... Uh, classify this as being when you're born again you actually resurrect as Christ did. Well Jesus however taught in, in John 3 uh, verses about 10 through 13 that we should be born from above meaning as in the beginning when God said to the Elohim let us make man in our image then man became flesh. But what it really means, some people that are born in the flesh, that's, all, that's as far as they're ever going to get. They, the flesh talks to them. They listen to it. says, I'm hungry. I need a warmer place. I need this. I need that. I need companionship. I need something else. And they never get above listening to the flesh body. But some finally remembering where they came from. Listen to the inner man, which is your spiritual self. And once you can be born of the Spirit, meaning recognize you're born from above and you're going back there, then um, it throws a little different slant on things. Ralph from Pennsylvania. Thank you for, so very much for your teaching. Well, you're very welcome. I, I love to teach God's Word. Where can we document something about the age of accountability. I agree with uh, what you teach, but would like to be able to document it in the Bible. Well, that is a tough one, is to document scripturally. I like to, in my own mind, and what brought me to my conclusion of how, whether or not to baptize a young, younger person, if there were a question about accountability being at that age, then I always think of Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. And I let the entire thing hinge on that. Do they fit that category? Do they fit the category described in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7? And I let that be the answer. Joe in Florida. Some people, well, here's another question on accountability. Some people believe the age of accountability is around 12 or 13 years old. Where do they get this belief? Where can I document in the Bible what the age of accountability is? I have searched and searched and cannot find it, not even in the book of Leviticus. Thank you for your help. Well, I, I, I guess I will explain why. What is it that is written in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8? The beginning of knowledge is to revere God, for a fool can never arise to that occasion. When someone begins to love the Lord Jesus Christ, and when they recognize the fact that he died for us in a mature mind, 12 or 13 doesn't have that much to do with it. I've known people 70 and 80 that weren't at the age of accountability uh, and didn't care to be. And I have known children five and younger that had been touched by the hand of God, that their wisdom was to the point, according to Proverbs 1-7, whereby they were accountable. All right, so there, there, is no, there is no rule of the thumb. It's a rule of the mind, and you have to analyze and discern each mind and caution, your, caution yourself very closely that you do not become a judge and try to play God. Listen and read 
The eye mirrors the soul. Look into the eyes of the child and listen and see what you hear. Uh, it will tell you naturally with the unction of the Holy Spirit. For That's for the real spiritual that wouldn't know that you were dealing spiritually anyway. Some people you have to really draw the whole elephant instead of just the tail for them. Topeka from, um, that's a strange name, from California. I, I'm, that's not, yeah. well, I'll say Topeka. Okay, where were the ethnos kings and queens predestined, as is the case of the elect? Yes, yes. The first eon was quite a time, was it not? Ruby from Arkansas. I am, I am wondering, is the cloning that the medical profession is doing now mentioned in the Bible? I um, seen a documentary last week that they are now ready to do it to human beings. Can I believe this is true? the will of Yahweh? No, you can't. Sorry. They're pulling our legs, all right? Have you not understood that the person that so-called cloned the sheep in Great Britain was pulling our legs? I don't want to call it a joke, but you might as well because he falsified records. And I want you to know coming out the gate, if you'll remember, I said... I've been around agriculture too long. I know he didn't keep the gate locked and the ram jumped the fence or he had about 350 test tubes and he's dabbing a little of this and a little. Of... There's no such thing as cloning. There's only one natural clone and God brought that into existence a long, long time ago. And it was not, the, in as much as Abel and Cain were twins, they didn't fit that category because they were separate uh, pregnations. But identical twins are clones. They're God's clones and it's the only clones you'll ever see. Now I know they're going to talk it up and I know they're going to say it. And I know they're going to, it's illegal at this time if I'm not mistaken and sometimes I... Uh, it could be, but not often. Um, I, it's not going to happen. All right. God owns all souls, and he's very careful who he lets them out to. Mike from Maryland. Why is there starving children in foreign countries and so much hard things happening if there is a God? Uh, don't blame it on God, friend. Let me tell you something, Mike. That's bad business. If a person brings a child into the world, they should take care of them. I'm not criticizing people that fall on hard times, but it's a sin to stay on hard times. We are human beings, and God gave us the ability to, through, um, through uh, our own inventiveness to find a way. There are starving children. I thank God that we have agencies that feed most of them. Unfortunately, sometimes the worst pictures are shown that really grab your heart. It really hurts me when I know that today in certain countries in Africa, slavery is taking place, that people are selling their own kind. That, that's terrible. There are Christian groups that raise money to buy them and free them. But in other words, a lot of times, many of the pictures you see are, it's not as that bad a state. I thank God that we have federal agencies that uh, try to take food into areas. And some people you can't help. You take like in Somalia, too many of them wanted their drugs to, to chew their, what is it they chew there, whatever it is, the drug. They wanted that instead of food, and they were at war over that. And you can take all the grain you want, and they no, they want to chew their hot stuff. So what can you do? Anyway, Jerry, Jesse from Mississippi. Ezekiel 44 speaks of the millennium concerning uh, burnt offerings. Why will there be 
slaughtering, there won't be. God, as it is written in Hosea 6.6, 6, wants your love. And that's what will be offered. There will be no more flesh in the millennium. Even the uh, Isaiah 11, where the lion lays down with the lamb, they're not carnivores. Why? They're not flesh. Michael in Texas. Job 22 in Psalms 50, a TV preacher said, These scriptures tell us to give money to the church. And if we give more money than we have to give, then God will bless us and provide. He won't because anybody is stupid that will give more than they've got. You know, that's, you, you have certain responsibilities like paying your bills. And if you give some church more money than you got, that means maybe borrowing a little to pay some preacher. But uh, if, if I can stop there, I want to say something. Do you know, uh, Michael, we're studying Job now. Let me, let me race this through my mind real quickly. Job 22. Yep, we got him. See, he's lying to you. I mean, he's one of those preachers I've been telling you about. I hope I better be right or this preacher's lying to you. No, I wouldn't do that. My memory doesn't fail me that much. Job 22 is written by one of the nuts. And anybody that would use it to raise money is also a nutcase. All right? Preachers, I mean, they'll preach on what those nuts say. They haven't got any better sense. That's, that's really awesome. I'm glad you called that in. Job 22, nutcase fundraiser. Just labeling that and mark the board clean. Ignorance is called. I'm out of time. I really want to say a word about love after making that statement about that poor dumb preacher. But uh, anyway, God loves you. Why? Because you enjoy studying his word in more depth and you seek and dig after his truth. And that's important to him. He loves you for it. Most important, you do this. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day. You know why? Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.